Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, let me just make this full screen. Uh, okay. All right, here we go. So um, my name is Michael Hoffman. For those who don't know me, um, I work at Osaka University and um, I'm just uh, going to talk about a little bit uh, today about my uh, research project that I've been working on and the results of my research project in uh, digital game-based uh, language learning and looking specifically at uh, s s learning through speaking activities and then the benefits for, for speaking and for general language acquisition. That's my explosion uh, uh, graphical effect there. So first of all, I'll um, just to give you a brief overview, I'll just uh, give you a little bit of background about my research project and a brief overview. And then I'll talk about the findings um, of, a, it's still an ongoing project. So I'll talk about some of my initial findings. And then um, at the end, I hope to have a little bit of time to talk about the limitations and advantages to this approach that I'm following with my study. And finally, some implications for teaching and learning. So um, I think over the, the past 20 years or so, uh, there's been a growing interest in using digital games as tools for, uh, for learning, not just for language learning, but for learning in general. So we have G2003 and Prensky 2001, which were quite big and influential uh, books that were published on this topic. And uh, you see a lot of, a lot of uh, recent publications also in uh, games for learning. And then in the core literature, in the computer assisted language learning literature, um, researchers have been in, interested in the potential uh, of games for language learning specifically uh, already since the 1970s and the, so since the early days of call. And also this field has seen a, a, a resurgence in recent years with uh, video games becoming uh, more, more sort of mainstream and, and uh, more accessible to a large number of learners uh, around the world. Um, so Peterson 2013 is a good overview of a lot of the uh, studies that have been done in using computer games for language learning. Now most of the past studies have involved uh, learn language learning through single player games or um, computer mediated communication between learners playing multiplayer games. And um, usually this is computer mediated communication, it's written communication, uh, although it might also be be uh, spoken, but that's more rare. And it might be between second language learners and other second language learners, um, or it might be between the second language learners and between L1 speakers of the language. So for my project, I was interested to see how this could be applied in the Japanese classroom situation. So I wanted to study the processes of peer learning um, in spoken interaction when learners cooperate to play a multiplayer game in a face-to-face -face situation. So in my project, the, the game-based learning is not computer mediated, but uh, the learners see each other uh, in person in the classroom context. And the video game that I chose to use was uh, the game called Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. So this game came out about five years ago. It was released for PC and later for other platforms. And basically the, the premise of the game is uh, the, several players must work together to defuse a time bomb. And the one player is the diffuser, and that player sees the bomb on the computer screen. And the other, the other player or players are the experts, and they um, have access to a, ma a manual that you can print out called the Bomb Diffusal Manual. And this manual contains instructions uh, on how to diffuse the bomb. So the crucial part here is that the diffuser cannot see the manual, and the experts cannot see the computer screen. So there's an information gap uh, which requires uh, communication between the two uh, sides in order to, to solve the game or succeed at the game. And each bomb consists of a combination of different information gap puzzles or modules as they're called in the game. And there are 11 of these different puzzle kinds in total. Uh, so so uh, there's also a timer, so it has to be, each puzzle has to be solved within the allotted time. Um, so this uh, encourages uh, uh, efficient communication as well. So just to give you a visual idea of what it looks like when the play, students play this game, you can see the diffuser in front of the computer um, and the two experts in the back looking at the manual. Um, so this is the typical setup that I used for, uh, for the gameplay sessions. 
So why did I choose this game specifically? Well, there are several reasons. Um, this is a new genre of game that hasn't been studied much in the or studied really at all in the core literature before. Um, this genre is called asymmetric operative puzzle games. And the asymmetric just means that the different players have access to different information. So they're not looking at the same screen. And this game was not designed for language learning purposes. Um, but I, I chose it uh, anyway because I thought it was a fun game to play for, for students. They would enjoy it and therefore it would be engaging, which I think is good for language learning. And then also crucially, it encourages a lot of speaking and listening. And especially in the Japanese EFL context, uh, where many learners are hesitant to speak, uh, this is, uh, I think, a very, a very nice feature of this game. Um, and then I think as well, this game could be used within a task-based language teaching framework. Um, because of the focus on meaning and other criteria that, that match, uh, I think, quite nicely with um, the principles and ideas of task-based language uh, teaching. And then the puzzles are procedurally generated, so this means the computer generates the puzzles in a different way every time, so the bomb is never the same uh, twice. And uh, this means that it keeps it fresh for, for longer and challenging for longer. Um, and also this game has been successfully integrated into university level English courses before in Japan. So for example, Domer, Kakali and Senna in 2017 published a paper in the JALP journal where they described how they successfully used this game to get their students uh, to speak in a communication class. So my research questions then were, the first question is, is there any evidence to suggest that, play, that playing this game collaboratively and with minimal teacher intervention uh, will improve learners second language proficiency? And the second question to follow up, if so, how exactly does this second language learning take place? So to answer these questions, I followed the uh, following general approach. So I tried to identify instances of learner to learner interaction. Uh, oh, sorry, I tried to identify instances within the learner to learner interaction of processes that are uh, believed to facilitate second language acquisition within the interactionist uh, framework of second language acquisition following earlier studies by Peterson. And then I also have tried to find uh, clear examples in learner to learner interaction where individual learners correctly or start to correctly use an L2 linguistic feature that they previously used incorrectly or lacked entirely. So you can think of this as the, the number one is looking for indirect evidence uh, of language learning based on a theoretical framework. And number two, I looked for direct evidence where you can, where you can uh, see a learner use a new feature that they clearly didn't know before, that they must have learned from the other players. And then uh, point number three, I uh, closely analyzed and categorized the interactions that led to the acquisition of the new uh, second language uh, uh, features. So for my methodology, uh, I collected data from four groups of three learners each, uh, and they play, they, each of these groups played the game over four 60-minute sessions. And then I video and audio recorded all of these play sessions. And to analyze the data, I transcribed, um, I'm still busy <laughs> transcribing uh, the, the recordings that I made. And then I developed a coding scheme to classify and label the interactions that I think uh, were relevant for second language acquisition. So here are my initial findings. Um, first of all, it, it was very obvious that the learners speak and listen a lot during this activity because this was kind of the thing I dreaded. Uh, I would set up this activity and then there'd be a lot of silence, right? Um, so although there were some periods of silence at the beginning as learners uh, got used to the game, um, quickly they started speaking a lot. Um, so in the second language acquisition theory for a long time, I think it's been the general consensus that a great, a big, a large, large amounts of comprehensible input in the second language and also producing comprehensible output uh, is very beneficial for a second language acquisition. And just to give you an idea, I, didn't, I don't have very exact information on this for a, for a variety of reasons, but just um, when I transcribed uh, one group of learners playing the game over four sessions, so this was about four hours of gameplay, uh, the, the dialogue, transcribed dialogue uh, covered more than 100 pages, so 113 page, single spaced pages of uh, output, which I thought indicates quite a lot of, of output. And of course, the, other, the ones who uh, listened got this as input as well. And then um, maybe sometimes, some, of course, some learners spoke more than other learners. But in general, because I gave each one 
um, and even I gave, gave each one uh, time to play the role of the diffuser for 20 minutes in the one hour sessions um, and then I cycled them around. Um, this basically forced everyone to, 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 to speak quite a lot because uh, if the diffuser doesn't speak, then the puzzle can't be solved, right? So um, this is, is a way in which the game mechanic balances the amount of speaking. So I think this uh, suggests the occurrence of second language acquisition within the cognitive SLA framework. And then secondly, I looked at negotiation for meaning. So negotiation for meaning uh, simply just refers to the process of attempting to uh, to repair communication breakdowns between speakers. So if there's a misunderstanding, the negotiation is uh, the sp speakers trying to say things in other ways, modifying their output and uh, trying to manage the discourse or using strategies of discourse management to, to uh, get the conversation or communication back on track, right? To, to, to convey the original intention or the original meaning. And this is also believed uh, in this interactionist model uh, to facilitate second language acquisition. So I don't really have time to, to go over the specific examples here because it's quite time consuming. But just to, to summarize, I think I found um, many different uh, examples of Discord management strategies used to prepare or prevent communication breakdown. So example, for example, uh, cases where learners would repeat or paraphrase their own utterances to make themselves more understandable or repeat or paraphrase uh, the other learner's utterances, uh, then back channeling to confirm understanding. So yeah, uh -huh, I see um, that they use these such, uh, such uh, uh, utterances very often. And then elaborating on uh, their own previous utterances. So for example, if they use a difficult term, they might explain it or define it. And this is also um, theorized to be very um, helpful for second language acquisition and then simplification of their own utterances as well as a type of discourse management strategy. So the occurrence of all of these instances seem to uh, support the idea that second language acquisition is taking place. And then another key concept in the uh, theoretical model is the idea of attention. So Schmidt stresses the importance of attention for successful second language acquisition. He argues that uh, learners need to consciously notice a new second language feature before they can acquire it. And I think noticing, the, the, I found quite a lot of examples that seem to clearly indicate that, that learners actively notice uh, something in another learner's um, or in one of their peers' language that they then t attempt to integrate into their own language. So for example, um, here we have a diffuser uh, seeing this picture of the, of the wire module and talking about the lines, but the more appropriate word in this case would be wires, um, cut the second wire, for example. And so she uses the word wire, wire and line. She uses these words interchangeably at first, but then you can see later on she corrects herself. So which line should I cut? And then she says wire. So I think instances like this uh, indicate uh, noticing, and this is also uh, a big factor in how um, second language acquisition can work through peer learning. So uh, this also suggests then the occurrence of second language acquisition. And then um, I think the, the qualitative and longitudinal research design has uh, sh shows us also uh, in a direct way how individual learners can make second language gains. So irrespective of, or independently of the, the theoretical framework. So we can see instances of vocabulary acquisition grammatical accuracy improvements and pronunciation accuracy improvements, maybe to a lesser extent, also from this data. Um, so the processes I think that are involved are still the ones, the processes of negotiation for meaning and noticing, um, but we could just see the learning happen directly. So just to give you some examples. Um, so for vocabulary acquisition, we have a student describing this bomb uh, at, the, at the bottom of the bomb, she says she sees this rectangular shape with FRK written on it, and she can't think of uh, what to call the, what to call this, right? She she gestures a rectangular shape um, in the shape of a label. So it's in the game uh, vocabulary. This is called a label, and she says this kind of thing, right? So she can't think of a word to describe uh, the label. And then um, just some, some later interactions from the, from the following session. So this, sorry, this was learner, learner one was the one who, who couldn't think of this word. So there we see learner two in, the, in session two uh, use the word label. Um, and then shortly afterwards, learner one who previously didn't use the word label, she uses the word as well. Um, this time she's in the expert role, so she can see the word 
in the manual. Maybe she uh, was prompted by that. Um, and then uh, later on, we have uh, le uh, learner uh, three also talk about label and then learner one uh, later on in session two when she's in the diffuser role. Now she doesn't see the manual anymore and she didn't recently hear anyone else uh, modeling this word for her, but she uses it spontaneously. And then uh, five minutes later, we see uh, learner one using the word label spontaneously again. And we see many further examples in sessions three and four. So this to me indicates uh, vocabulary acquisition or it seems to be uh, uh, suggestive of vocabulary acquisition. And then here's an interesting example, I think of uh, improvements in grammatical accuracy. So in the first session, we have these uh, learners one, two, three again, and then learner three sees this maze module on the right here. And um, he says he's trying to describe where the, where the red arrow is or where the red uh, triangle is. So he says, um, from top one, two, three, four, from right two. So this is a bit of a clumsy way of, of uh, explaining it. And so he, he seems to lack the grammatical structure second from the top or a uh, second from the right. Um, this is in the first session. And then in the second session, um, we see, sorry, let me just, uh, this was learner three, right? Who, who was unable to use the structure. Then we see learner two and learner one both use the expression second from the right. Uh, learner one repeats second from the left. Well, it's a mistake with left, but he uses the right structure. And then learner three says second from the right. So learner three, who was unable to use this expression before, now uses it. And it's, I think he, it's, he models his own uh, language use on that of learner two and one. And then we see it again a few minutes or a few seconds later, a second from the right, learner three repeats. And then um, also in, in, in a follow-up to that, uh, 20 minutes later in the same session, we see uh, learner one, um, sorry, we see learner three um, talk about the fourth line from the right, second from the bottom. And this time he, he's not prompted by one of the other learners um, to say that you don't, you don't see one of the others modeling it for him. So he's using it spontaneously, which I think suggests full acquisition of this form that he previously lacked. And uh, he can do it with a high degree of automaticity because he, um, he uh, uses it without thinking or without pausing or without hesitating. So I think this is quite a nice example of, uh, suggesting the occurrence as well of second language acquisition. And here, uh, I'll try and just to go quickly over this, but improvement in pronunciation accuracy. Um, yeah, we have uh, the word circle. Uh, I noticed that we had one learner of uh, Chinese origin, she's L1, and she pronounced it, I think, on, with the first vowel sound uh, that sounds like similar to standard English pronunciation, but the two other learners were Japanese and they pronounced the a, the, the uh, for circle, they pronounce more of a ah, right? Circle. Uh, so I noticed that they mispronounced uh, these two these two words, but then that in a, and by session two, after possibly after uh, listening or after the exposure to the to the correct pronunciation by learner one, learner three uh, pronounced it uh, with a with a more appropriate vowel sound in the first syllable. And then uh, we see learner two also pronouncing it with a more appropriate vowel sound uh, two times after hearing it pronounced by uh, learner one. So uh, maybe this evidence is not quite so strong because they were, the, I think both learner, learner two and learner three still used it quite inconsistently and it's not always, it's quite difficult to hear from the recordings exactly what vowels, how they're pronouncing the vowel sounds. But, um, but uh, yeah, so I think maybe I should look for some more information here, but this seems to be pointing to uh, pronunciation accuracy improvements. So just to give you an overview then uh, of my results, I noticed that learners uh, speak and listen a lot. Uh, I think there's good evidence for negotiation for meaning occurring. There's uh, good evidence for learners noticing gaps in the L2 language. There's evidence for vocabulary acquisition and for improvements in grammatical and pronunciation accuracy, although the pronunciation evidence is still a little weak. So then to answer my research questions, uh, is there any evidence to suggest that SLA occurs when learners play this game? I think yes, um, based on what I just showed you. 
And then through which mechanisms does the game facilitate S A? So I think many of the examples illustrate to us how uh, the process of negotiation for meaning and noticing can work to uh, in a peer-based peer communicative language teaching approach or task-based approach um, to, to for, uh, it, it helps us to see concretely, right, and empirically how language learning can actually take place. Right, so just uh, to give you a brief, a brief uh, a synopsis of the limitations and advantages of this type of study. I think a big limitation is that the results are not easily generalizable because I used one specific game. Uh, there's, there's a small number of learners that were involved and they were quite a homogeneous learner group. Um, and then I think the uh, direct evidence examples do not necessarily provide conclusive proof of acquisition because uh, just because I observed an error uh, or an initial failure doesn't mean that the that the learner really didn't know that word at all. Maybe they, it might have just been a temporary failure to recall. And then also in some cases, uh, maybe I only showed short-term retention. Um, although in some cases uh, in session, if a, a gain was made in session two, then it was also observed in session three and four. So in some cases, I think there's good evidence for longer term uh, retention. And some degree of subjective judgment was required for the transcription. So for example, the absence of presence of short morphemes might have been difficult at some times to transcribe. And also, of course, the phonemic description or transcriptions, it can be very challenging for the vowel sounds. And then uh, the results also seem to hinge upon assumptions made by the theoretical model of second language acquisition, especially the first three points. And not, not all people accept this uh, interaction as a cognitive uh, framework of second language acquisition. And then advantages. I think, of course, I wouldn't have done my, my study in this way if I didn't think there were also some good advantages of this approach. So I think the qualitative study of learned discourse and interaction can provide a deeper and a more holistic perspective of the processes through which SLA uh, occurs than, than we can get with quantitative studies. So it gives us a deeper, deeper insight into what's happening. And the exploratory approach can also help us to discover unanticipated mechanisms or patterns because for a qualitative, uh, for quantitative study, you need to uh, plan very carefully exactly what, what you want to look at and uh, with, a, with an expectation or quite a clear expectation of your findings. But with an exploratory quanti uh, qualitative approach, uh, you don't have such limitations and then you can discover very interesting things along the way that you never anticipated. And then also I think what's very interesting is you can trace the chronological development of specific linguistic features in individual learners. Uh, and I think this can constitute a strong, strong evidence for second language acquisitions, even uh, if you don't necessarily agree with all the assumptions made in the theoretical model. So this kind of analysis also allows us to directly observe peer learning processes in action. And I think this may also have implications for how we evaluate theoretical models of second language acquisition. So just some final implications. I think the study uh, prov provides some empirical evidence uh, that games uh, that are designed, even if they're designed purely for entertainment, they can still be again fully exploited for educational aims. And um, I think by shedding light on the process underlying uh, effective digital game-based language learning, uh, the findings of the study can help teachers and also game creators to make better informed choices in selecting and designing games for language learning purposes. And then finally, uh, since the learners with intermediate, uh, since learners with intermediate or above uh, English proficiency can play the game with no or minimal teacher guidance, I think it can also be, this game can also be effectively put to use in an autonomous L2 learning uh, situation. So for example, in a self access learning center context or even at learners homes, they can play this game and still get quite a lot out of it in terms of language learning outcomes. So then these are my references for this, uh, for this uh, uh, pe uh, presentation. And then thank you very much for your attention. And I hope we still have a little bit of time left uh, for questions and comments. And I should just mention this was, uh, this research was supported by uh, uh, Kathleen Hee Grant. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Michael Hafmeyer. All right, everyone, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourselves and open your cameras if you wish, so you can let Michael know your appreciation by either applauding on your mic or pushing the applause button at the bottom of your Zoom window. So thank you, Michael. My pleasure. Now we do have time for questions. Um, 
I'm going to try and see if you physically raise your hand, but one way that's going to be a little bit easier for me to catch you. Oh, if in this view, I can catch everyone if your cameras are open. Another way is by kind of just using the applause symbol or the raise your hand symbol. Okay, so go ahead, Mr. Honus. Well, yeah. Oh. Um, you you mentioned this. I, I use this game as well. Oh. Uh, and you were saying uh, digitally based. Um, how can you just go back at the beginning? I missed the first part of how you actually set it up. Do they do it remotely? No, no, no. This uh, so I, I, so I, I, I haven't actually used this game in my regular classes yet. Uh, okay. I just, I just recruited some students to come and play this game, uh, separate from my classes for my for, my, for this research project. So, okay. and, and then I, ha I have them played in groups of three. Okay. So one, one in front of the computer and two with a manual. Yeah. And um, so yeah, they played over four sessions of about an hour each. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, fantastic. Yeah, I do. I play with this, and I generally concur with all of your conclusions. Oh, great. Thank yeah, you. I, I don't really find any. The only thing that I would mention would be um, kind of the follow-up aspect to the game, mm. uh, talking to them about the game, talking to them about the strategies of the game. Yeah, yeah. I, for, for this study, I was, I was quite uh, interested in, you know, what the students would do uh, if they use this game autonomously. So I, I kind of deliberately kept the uh, briefing and debriefing sessions to a minimum. Okay. But, but, of course, but of course, if you want to use this practically in the classroom, then, uh, then that can be very helpful as well. And, uh, yeah, yeah. and yeah, you'd probably, you'd probably approach it in a slightly different way. <laughs> yes, Thank I, you. good job. Thank you. Are there any other questions that people would like to ask? Okay, Oliver, go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, Michael. Um, yeah, oh. I've, I've been aware of this game and tried it with some students, a small group of students before as well. Um, oh, I was just wondering what you think about, um, it's, so am I right in, in thinking that you pretty much taught them how to play the game, but you didn't give them sort of the language to use or anything? You just kind of let them experiment with how to communicate or? Yes, for the most part, I think. Um, I, ge I generally had them, I forgot to do this for some of the groups, but I generally had them do the tutorial, the in-game tutorial at the beginning, where it just explains how the game works. And then, uh, so my, my students are there, I'm teaching at the, at the uh, English uh, department at, at, at uh, Osaka University, and they, the students are all English majors, uh, majoring in linguistics and literature, so they have quite a high level of English, I would say, probably uh, kind of high intermediate on average. Uh, level of English, so I thought, yeah, uh, of course, if you use this game with with low intermediate students or a lower level of proficiency, then uh, then the more scaffolding would be necessary. I think somebody else has created an EFL version of the bomb defusal manual that's been simplified. Or, yeah, so that's that's quite helpful as well that you might want to look into if you if you want to use it with a with a slightly lower level class. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, do you think there's any um, uh, anything? Uh, give less support or so, sorry um you, you yeah maybe up a one, bit one way would be to give um kind of, all right um what do you think about giving things like cheat sheets or you know glossaries or whatever as support at the beginning of a game well, think... well i i was kind of trying hoping that there would be a lot of negotiation for meaning so i was hoping that there'd be a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of problems because then i i thought that would make for more interesting interactions um, uh -huh. So, so that's why I set it up with this with this way, and I, I thought I'd see what it's like with without mm. much help, and yeah. then if you know if it if it really uh, became a question of the students not producing any output or getting completely stuck, then then I would help, and and I didn't in some cases. I think that a big problem that uh, the main problem probably that I had was the students would. The, the diffuser would describe everything on the bomb and then the for two minutes and then the others would sit and take notes and then they try and solve everything at the same time rather than focusing on one thing at a time. And right, right, right. so so if I if I saw things like that and that really hindered their progress or uh, then then I would say, well, 
you know, why don't you try doing it like that? Then I would intervene. Um, but but I was also just curious to see how, how this game could work if the mm. students didn't have my guidance, if I just maybe made little made little in, uh, introduction sheets and put that in the self-access center for the students to use, uh, mm. would they be able to to cope? And yeah. I think I think based on what I saw, uh, definitely yes. Uh, uh, and uh, and I also interviewed the students afterwards and uh, asked them, you know, would you play this game uh, <laughs> if I didn't make you play this game or if I didn't recruit you? And most of them, well, I don't know how honest they were being, but most of them said uh, yes, they would. That they enjoyed it a lot and they would. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, they would play it if it were available in the uh, in the uh, self access center. Also, also they mentioned that they'd enjoy it, probably they'd enjoy it even more if they had some native speakers or some L one speakers with them in the group. Um, right. But that was kind of difficult to set up. Yeah in my situation. Yeah, I think um, when I did it, I did, um, you know, I did the first round with me sort of explaining to all the students and then they could pick up some language from me. And then after that, I had them do mm. it with each other. Um, but yeah, there's, I guess there's all sorts of different levels of scaffolding you could, you could do. But, uh, you, did it, you did it with your whole class or with a small group? Um, no, I just did it with a small group. And I mean, it is a paid game and you need to have it on a computer. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a little bit uh, limiting as to how you could use it with big groups on, unless you have all those resources. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, what, just a small group, yeah. Can I just ask, Oliver, was that your... Uh, your own idea or was that part of the school's sort of curriculum? Because I know I, I think that's uh, one no, of the ones that got in these. Yeah, definitely not part of the curriculum. Um, no, it's just my idea. I just heard of it. I'm just interested in games. Oh, okay. Because, yeah, a couple of other people, I, I present the JALT call as well, and a couple of people have told me that they've used it as well. So I think there's quite a, there's quite a kind of a large, well, a, a significant yeah. tiny community of teachers using this game. Yeah, a JALT call. I think there were like three presentations on yeah. it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was quite, uh, quite surprised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, Michael. All right, so. no problem. Thanks for the question. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, go ahead, Curtis. Oh, uh, if Michael, Michael next. Ask a question. Oh, yeah, okay. Hi, Curtis. Hey, Michael. <laughs> yeah. uh, go ahead, my uh, other no, off to you. I, I can always talk to him later, too. Uh, no, I, I, I was intrigued within the model of the peer learning, um, ah, yes. where essentially the feedback process is going to be recasting. Mm. How are they choosing the model? I think one of the examples you gave was that there was one Japanese person and two Chinese, and they adopted the model of the Japanese learner. So uh, how would that come about? How can one ensure the model to which they gravitate? Uh, <laughs> You can't, I think, or at least uh, if you want to have them do it autonomously. I think this, t I mean, it's difficult. I think this is, this is, I talked about the advantages, but I think there are, there are quite a few hindrances as well to, to, to effective SLA using this kind of approach that, that I didn't talk about today, but that I'd like to talk about maybe in a future presentation. I mean, uh, so, did, so yeah, you, you certainly... Do you, you have any examples of the contrary happening? Oh, yes, yes. I have, I have examples where somebody... I think generally, the student, if if one uh, if one student speaks a lot more than the others and speaks with more confidence, the others would sort of look at that student as a role model and in peer learning situations, and then they'd start mm -hmm. copying what that student said. So of course, if that student says something wrong or uses an inappropriate word, then the others are probably equally likely to to start using that word uh, or to to follow the the, the, the leading student. And and I, I think yeah, the, this can happen. And I, I've I found cases where uh, I think that show that show quite clearly this this kind of thing happening, but I haven't uh, that, I haven't really prepared the data for that. I mean, obviously, you made reference to a task-based approach, mm. but I, I wouldn't necessarily expect notions of correctness in uh, however many inverted commas to. Uh, to yeah. Advance. So, wouldn't one want a, a feedback stage? With oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to jump in it. here. So this is probably a great time for us to maybe move this discussion because it seems you have a lot more to talk about. Move it to the main hall that's being hosted by um, Don Lukovic, and she can provide you a space. I've got a setup for the next person. So could everybody kind of unmute your mics again and give Michael Hoffmeyer another heartfelt round of applause for this great presentation. Thank you very much.
So yeah, I'll, I'll move to the to the main hall then, and um, then we can sort of speak further in the breakout room if, if you. And like. then you don't have to worry about time at all. Okay, great. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank I'll you. be next to present. Uh, my name is Hiro yes. Kubari. Yes. Okay, let's get yep. you set up. I can uh, upload my PowerPoint slide or uh, chat. Um, you don't need to upload them. If they are on your computer, that will be fine. Yes, uh, so I can share my PowerPoint slide, you know? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> So would you like to do a, a test share right yes. now? Right, yeah. Okay. Can you see? It's coming. I Okay, I can see it in the full view right now with all the slides on one page. This one, uh, you can see my slide? Now I can see it perfectly. Outline okay. and the, this is okay. Okay, that's fantastic. Just I'd like to test the video, you know.